I'm Michael Clark, and this is Text Message. And today we're going to talk about suffering. We, we sometimes ask the question, have you suffered as much as? And then someone will say who they've suffered as much as. But I want to look at today a few different segments. We want to look at a shelter in the time of storm where Roger Comstock will interview a war veteran, David Hughes. We're going to look at Kyle Butt's segment, Out With Doubt on Evil, Pain, and Suffering. And also we're going to ask the question, does baptism mean immersion? And we're going to answer that at the end of the program. So stick with us on text message as we talk about suffering. When it comes down to living the Christian life, it's where he leads, I will follow. To daily life. Those that were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Thank you for joining me today for text message. Some of the main people that suffer in this world are our veterans. They suffer on the battlefield as they try to protect our freedom, but sometimes they suffer when they come home. They suffer because of PTSD. They suffer because sometimes they don't have a job waiting for them when they get back home. And there's a lot of difficulties and things to overcome coming back from a tour. And as we think about veterans and think about other people, even in Scripture, who suffered for the cause of Christ, for the cause of someone, I think about Paul. I think about Paul in Acts 9 and verse 16 when God said to Ananias, I'm going to show Paul how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now that's an interesting point. How many things he must suffer for my name's sake? Here's Saul at the time who would later become Paul as he would take his Gentile name as the Apostle Paul. Here he is praying, trying to find out what he needs to do to be saved. And God says he's going to suffer for my cause. Roger Comstock is a good friend of ours and he is going to interview David Hughes, a veteran, who no doubt would have some difficulties being a war veteran, as we mentioned, seeing things perhaps that are difficult to fathom, and also having to experience things that the most, peop most people in the world don't experience. I hope you'll listen to this as we look at a veteran and their in instance of suffering. My first full-time preaching work was in Bridgeport, Alabama, and David was a teenager, maybe a senior, junior, senior in high school. Starting college, actually. When, you, when we first came when to, I was to Bridgeport. To and, and so I really didn't get to know him all that well, but he was always, I was always impressed. He was a, uh, then was rather quiet, uh, a fine young man, comes from a, a fine family uh, there in Bridgeport. And David uh, went to school, uh, to college at the Citadel, right. a military school. Right and eventually went into the United States Army. Right. And uh, David served our nation in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Yes. And what was the time frame of that, David? Um, 2005 through 2008. And how many tours did you do? Three tours. Three tours, and one, in, how were? I went to Iraq and then two trips to Afghanistan. I see, yeah. okay. And part of uh, what I wanted to mention too, David was uh, very seriously injured in a, in by a um, IED. Is that what they're called? IED, improvised and, explosive device. And uh, and he, you were, if I remember correctly, a captain. As captain. Uh, um, and he was uh, very seriously uh, injured, and uh, some of his men. Uh, I think you said three of your men were. When the the incident where I was was wounded, I lost two of my guys. Two of your men. But had lost another guy in another IED incident prior to that. Okay. So you had lost three of your men that were in your direct right. uh, responsibility. And, and since then I've lost another member right. from my team. Hmm. And as you know, the, the Special Forces teams are 12 men. Hmm. And they're very small and they're a very tight-knit group. And, and as a matter of fact, it was the medic that pulled me out of the vehicle and treated me the night I was injured. Wow. who has since been killed in Afghanistan just this past September. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and part of that, and coming to that realization, I mean, you know, there's a side of it that we can, to some degree, we can understand being away from our families. But uh, I don't think those of us who have never served in the capacity that you men have can understand what it's like to be in that, in, in that environment. Um, David, I, as I said, I, I, I didn't know you well and as uh, you kind of moved on to college when I first came to right. the Bridgeport area, but uh, I know your family and been close to your family uh, for a number of years. But uh, David, is you, you know, when you were injured, you were in Afghanistan. I was in is Afghanistan. That correct? That's correct. And uh, um, do you mind telling about 
the circumstances and the actual incident when you were injured? Sure. Um, we, were, we were in southern Afghanistan and we had had just signed for what they called an RG-31, which was, if you've watched the news, you hear them talk about a mine-resistant vehicle. It's, it's a vehicle that it's the newest version that they've designed to take a hit from an IED and, and, and increase the survivability chances of the crew or the, the men and women inside. Um, prior to that, the six months before that, we'd been riding around in a, we called them GMVs, ground mobility vehicles, where you pull the doors off, you're sitting hanging sideways at it with a, crew serve weapon in your lap when you're out on patrol um, and we hit, we we'd just been told to come into Kandahar pick our new vehicles up and take them back to our fire base and that's exactly what we were doing when we hit this IED mm -hmm. and um, it to put it in perspective the that mine resistant vehicle is about the size of a dump truck Wow if you if you wanted to put it in kind of a civilian terms uh, the IED we hit through our vehicle about 50 feet through the air and flipped it. Wow. And um, we came to rest on, our, on the driver's side. So when I woke up, this is about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, when I woke up, I was, I was hanging sideways. Uh, if you've ever had tunnel vision where you thought you were maybe going to pass out, where everything just kind of, you see the, your peripherals leaving you and it closes in on you. I kind of had the reverse of that where I just saw a tiny opening and then I was having a hard time figuring out what was happening because I was not completely unconscious. Um, when I smelled the cordite, the explosive, I, I knew then what had happened. At first I thought, well, maybe we ran off the ditch, ran off in the right. ditch or something. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but when I smelled that, I knew, A, we'd hit an IED. And then when I heard Billy next to me, my driver, um, and again, it's a sound I'll never forget, uh, I knew that he was in serious trouble hmm. and he's and Billy died yeah, sorry. and um, and so it was it was completely dark and then and my first thoughts you know it, you're, when you, as a soldier you're trained to self-assess your your own wounds first because you're no good to anyone else if you can't continue to function right, right. so the first thing I did was check my legs to see if they were there to see if I needed to put a tourniquet mm -hmm. on my legs uh, when I realized that those were intact I said a quick thank you to God <laughs> and um, but then my, my next thought was you know I had blood running down my face I couldn't breathe I had a collapsed lung um, it had shattered my L2 vertebra uh, in, my, in my spine which I later had had temporary paralysis from from the instant um, but then I heard Billy and I, I started trying to talk to him and just grab him and, and hold on to him and let him know help was coming <laughs> Um, and then, of course, my, my main concern was I was waiting on them to ambush us. Mm -hmm. as, I'm, as I'm hanging there sideways, I can't, my, I had taken a hit to my arm, my thumb had been cut open, uh, had blood on my hands that were slippery. I could not operate my, my harness, my seat belt, to, to get out of there, and I was, I was stuck. I could not be extracted until my men got to me and, oh, yeah. and extracted me. And, uh, and so I was waiting on, which they would normally do, hit you with an IED and then RPGs, rocket propelled grenades, and then small arms fire. Mm -hmm. and I was waiting on all that to start up, basically, as I was sitting there. Um, but that, luckily, it did not turn out to be the case. My men got to us, extracted us, uh, got us loaded out in helicopters, and uh, it killed, killed Bill, and then it killed uh, another guy that was attached to my team, was an Air Force um, uh, JTAC, or Basically, he's the guy that worked with me and helped call in airstrikes if we, if we got in trouble. Mm -hmm. And it killed Will instantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd worked with him for almost the entire deployment, so I'd gotten really close to him as well. So and it, about how long of time would that be, that, that deployment? We were, we were on our sixth, our sixth or seventh month of about an eight, nine-month deployment. I see. So. I see. The, the spiritual things, both of you, uh, I know of uh, your families, you've, as we sometimes say, have grown up in the, the churches of Christ, and your families are, are faithful people and, and godly people. How did, in, in that environment, when, when or how did, did your, your faith kind of kick in? Or, or maybe the opposite. Were there times that 
your faith struggled. Mm -hmm. David, how about you as far as your, uh, your faith and your trust in God? Were, were there times that, was there ever a time that you began to doubt uh, that, uh, Lord, why have you done this to me? Or is there even a Lord? Uh, well, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. I related a lot, you know, with David and, you know, the battles that he fought and the dependence he had upon the Lord. Right. Um, and I and I always, you know, before every mission, I would I had a specific verse in Psalms that I would just read, and um, and you know, and we didn't, you know, where we were located, we didn't have there were no chaplains with us, right? You know, we didn't have a chapel service, and and so you, anything you any nourishment you received spiritually was on your own, right? And, and it was just it was through reading the scripture, mm -hmm. um, but then. Um, the first guy I lost, you know, I was able to pull the team in and say, hey, you know, it's, um, we don't know why, but we just, we know we had to keep pushing forward and do our job. Right. Um, you know, we, we had a, a bad couple of months there where it was just, we were in a very bad location. Uh, we were surrounded by AEDs when we got there. Yeah. And, you know, in, in, in a matter of two days, we pushed out, lost one of our guys, came back to our fire base and, Lost another guy. It was actually an, an Afghanistan uh, soldier that we've been working with. But you still get you get to know those guys. Sure. You, you hate to see anybody perish. Yeah. Um, but I'll be honest, Roger. I mean, it's you know, and I think my wife will be the first to tell you I've struggled with. Sure. It. I have struggled. And when we lost Slim, Master Sergeant Dan Adams, the medic that worked on me just this past September. Right. The, the team got back together wow. at Fort Bragg to pay our respects. Wow. And you know, the wives got to talking and they all had that conversation of, and it's, they're all acting the same. Mm -hmm. I'm walking on eggshells when I'm in the house. I don't know, right. I say things and they just completely snap. And, mm -hmm. and there has been the, the questions of why. And, um, and there's been anger. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that I've been angry. I've, 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 I've been confused and, 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 and searching for answers and, and that inner peace. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I'll be honest, I still, I'm still in, I know the answer, but to, to experience that peace, I'm still struggling to obtain that. Okay. And I think if there's anything I could say today that people hear me say, it's, you've alluded to it, is the fact that my parents brought me up in such a, tremendous way well you know those those and that's exactly uh, to taught, follow taught, the taught, lord taught us. yeah to follow yeah. the lord and if they hadn't have roger yeah i really don't know where i'd be today well it's and as a new father yeah. that's my lesson learned in life is that right. how crucial it is to have these young people right and bring them up in the ways of the Lord. Right. Thank you again, both of you, for being here and sharing this part of your life and, and, and your, ser your service to our nation and what you continue to do mm -hmm. to, serve, uh, to serve veterans and, and their families. That's, that's great. I'm, I'm honored to be able to call both of you my brother in Christ. I, I am proud of both of you. Thank you for having us. Yes, sir. Thank you. No doubt we are so thankful for any veteran that is in our country for the work that they do to help us have our freedom. And we're so thankful for all the hard work they put into it. And we hope that that interview was encouraging to you as Roger Comstock interviewed David Hughes. The question is asked sometimes, why is there suffering? It's a good question. It's a question that many people have struggled with throughout their lives of why is there suffering in the world? They ask over and over again, I'm dealing with a difficulty and I don't understand why. I can show you the verse where suffering originated. It's all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Look with me at verse 16. To the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. There you have it. There's the problem. There's where suffering originated. Back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit that they had no business partaking of, suffering entered into the world. Anytime you want to deal with suffering in life because of a loss of a loved one, a loss of an income, anything, you name it, that suffers, that causes suffering, you can go all the way back to, Garden of, to the Garden of Eden 
and find where suffering originated. As we look at this evil pain and suffering question, I can think of no one better to answer it in today's modern day and age than Brother Kyle Butt. I think about Thomas B. Warren, and he wrote a great book on this as well, but I've heard Brother Butt before talk about this subject of evil pain and suffering, and he does a great job with it. So stick with us as we discuss evil pain and suffering on Out With Doubt with Kyle Butt. Can you imagine a parent who would have a child and take that child down to the basement, lock that child up in chains, and never allow that child to make his or her own decisions? Would any person describe that type of action as an action of love? No, certainly not. If God is love and love allows the freedom of choice, then we also must conclude that if the freedom of choice is allowed, sometimes a person can make the wrong choice. What happens when you make a wrong choice? What if the consequences for your choices were the exact same whether you made the right choice or the wrong choice? What if you worked hard for money and your consequences were the same as if you stole money? What if you told the truth, the consequences were the exact same as if you lied? What if you slept with someone before you were married and the consequences were the exact same as if you waited until marriage? What would you be able to learn from a situation or a system like that? Well, nothing. You would not be able to hone in on the good qualities and reject the bad qualities. When God designed humanity with the freedom of choice, He designed humanity so that their choices would naturally accrue or bring about consequences. Some consequences are good when you make good decisions. And when you make bad decisions, sometimes those consequences are very detrimental and painful. Let me give you what I would consider several of the primary reasons that there is suffering in this world. One reason that people suffer is because they make wrong decisions. Have you ever made a wrong decision and suffered because of that? Suppose that a young man and a young woman who are not married decide that they are going to engage in premarital sex. They are going to engage in this illicit activity and they don't use the protection that they are encouraged to use by their school and one of them ends up with a sexually transmitted disease. Whose fault is that? Is that God's fault? Suppose the young girl ends up pregnant and the young father decides he doesn't want anything else to do with his girlfriend and leaves the scene. Whose fault is it that that young girl now has a sexually transmitted disease and is pregnant? Can she blame God for that? Absolutely not. In fact, it's that young girl's fault. What happens when a person makes wrong decisions? Often, those wrong decisions lead to pain and suffering. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, But let none of you suffer as an evildoer, as a thief, as a murderer, as a busybody in other people's matters. What is Peter saying? He's saying, if you do these things, you will suffer. What happens when a young man decides he's going to go out and drink alcohol. He takes in so much alcohol that his vision is impaired. His reflexes are slow. He gets behind the wheel of a car. He drives down the road and he runs into a large concrete, concrete bridge. What happens there? Let's say the ambulance comes and gets him, pulls him out, and he is paralyzed from the neck down. Whose fault is that? God, why did you... No. Not God's fault. It's the young man's fault. But now, admittedly, sometimes it's not a person's individual choice. Sometimes we suffer because other people make bad choices. Suppose a 
teenager decides that he no longer wants to live on this earth and he loads several semi-automatic weapons and he marches into his school and he shoots those semi-automatic semi weapons all across his school and uh, injures several of his classmates and then finally culminates in, and shoots himself. Those injured classmates, what have they done to deserve to be shot in the shoulder or the leg or the back? Is it their fault? Is their fault their classmate went crazy and shot them? It's not their fault, is it? Whose fault is it? Well, it's the wrong decision made by their classmate. So why do they suffer for that? It's not their fault. No. It's the wrong decision made by someone else. They suffer because that other person, their classmate, has the freedom of choice just like they do. Well, how are we going to remedy that situation? Should we say, well, I want the freedom to choose, but I don't think my classmate should have the freedom to choose? Should we say, God, I'm going to be responsible for the freedom to choose, and I'm going to make the right decisions, but these other people should not get the freedom of choice because they're not going to make the right decisions? No. It's not how it works, is it? We get the freedom to choose just like other people get the freedom to choose, and there are consequences for those choices. But now sometimes the suffering in our lives is not because of our decisions. It's not because of others around us, their decisions, but it's because of decisions from previous generations. Their grandfathers or great-grandfathers or great-great-grandfathers. Now, let me give you an example. Suppose you go over to India, and in certain parts of India, there are people who are starving to death. You look down at a little two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old child, and that child looks like little more than a bag of skin and bones. His belly is protruding because he is malnourished, and he is literally starving to death. Why is he starving to death? Well, obviously because he doesn't have enough food to eat. Is it because there's not enough food in the country? No. As you stand there and watch, cattle are walking by this famished child. Cattle by the hundreds that if slaughtered could be used to feed thousands of starving children. Why is it that those cattle walk by and are not slaughtered to feed the children? Because previous generations have taught that those cattle are incarnate relatives of that child and that it would be a sin to kill those cattle. And so those cattle walk about with more privileges than a starving child, and that child dies of starvation because his parents won't kill those cattle, those cattle that are worshipped, those cattle that are looked upon as ancient dead relatives who are incarnate in those cattle bodies. Why does that child suffer? because previous generations have made bad decisions. Sometimes we will suffer because previous generations have made bad decisions. Well, what's the remedy to that? Don't let generations have the freedom of choice. You can't do that because that would, since God, the Bible says, is no respecter of persons, that would mean your generation wouldn't get the freedom of choice. Pain and suffering have benefits. Oh, well, you think, I don't know about that. I sure would like to live with no pain. I sure would like to live with no suffering. Would you? Would you like to live with no pain and suffering? There are approximately 17 people in the United States of America that has a population of about 330 million. 17 of them live in a world where they don't feel pain. I was just reading about one young boy, four years old, lives in a world where he does not feel pain. He has a disease called CIPA, congenital insensitivity to pain and hydrosis. They said they thought he was the perfect baby. He would sleep for 23 hours a day, never cried because he was hungry, and then they noticed something was wrong with him. When he would bash his head against the wall, he wouldn't cry. He would act like he didn't even feel it. When his teeth started coming in, 
He would gnaw on his tongue so it was so swollen that you couldn't separate his tongue from his mouth. At least visually, you couldn't even tell which was which. Couldn't feel pain at all and lives a very difficult life and is not projected to live past 20, 30, 40 Oh, wouldn't it be great if you couldn't feel? No, it would not. In fact, it would be a nightmare because pain often causes us to take appropriate action so that we don't continue to allow things that would destroy us. Suppose it's a cold day in the middle of winter and you're out, you're playing in the snow, you're having a snowball fight, you come in, you back up to a fire, you start warming your hands. If you don't feel pain, if you don't have the ability to feel pain, let's say your pants catch on fire. You don't feel that your pants are on fire and you don't react in time and that fire burns your muscle fibers, burns all the way to Why would it burn and debilitate your legs? Because you couldn't feel the pain. Pain has benefits. It can send us to the doctor or the hospital for a cure and in a spiritual sense, the Bible says about Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by what? By the things which he suffered. James in James chapter 1 said, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Pain and suffering cause individuals to grow spiritually, cause individuals to develop the characteristics that they need to live eternally with God. Thanks so much for being with us today. Always, if you have a question, text the number on your screen and someone here will get with you as, pos as soon as possible and answer that question for you. Speaking of questions, we're going to ask the question now and answer it. Does baptism mean immersion? You know, many people today are asking the question of why can't we just sprinkle? Well, I do have a scripture in the Bible that kind of disproves sprinkling's a possibility because of the wording that is used. Look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 38. Acts 8, 38, the Bible records that he commanded the chariot to stand still. This is Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. And they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Now, if sprinkling is okay, that would mean that it's probably in a, a bottle of some kind or just something small that you could sprinkle over someone. Explain to me then how Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water. No, 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 no. It had to be a body of water large enough for both two men to be able to fit inside and for both Philip and the eunuch to go down into the water. Baptism does mean immersion. It comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to be fully immersed. I thank you so much for being with us today, and hopefully next week you'll tune in. As always, I'm Michael Clark. And we'll see you next time on ready, Text Message. Lord, I want to be ready, Lord, ready, Lord. I, I want to be ready, Lord, ready, Lord. I, I want to be ready for the judgment day. When the bridegroom comes, will I be there to meet him in the air? And will I be ready for the judgment day?